all, and welcome back to another thrilling episode of Adventuring Academy, the vodcast where we talk about all things tabletop and how to run games for your friends the best we know how. Today, our incredible guest. Oh my goodness, I am so excited to introduce her. She is a writer, storyteller, and streamer, and also the community relations coordinator for Monty Cook Games. You know her as the murder bird monk Dahani on Rivals of Waterdeep, and will be in the DM seat for the ninth season, which just premiered. She's also one of the writers for the POC-led TTRPG Into the Motherlands, along with many friends of the show, such as Gabe Hicks, Tanya DePass, and B. Dave Walters, and his regular contributor to the D&D Adventurers League. My friend and yours, please welcome Ms. Latia Jaquise! Oh my gosh. Um, can you... Uh, I don't... I've never had an intro like that. <laughs> It's like, I'm over here, like, he's talking about somebody really awesome. I'm going to cheat. Wait, that's me. <laughs> uh, the CV speaks for itself, Latia. You do incredible work, and we're so delighted to have you. How are you doing? I'm, uh, I'm wonderful. I'm happy to be here. Um, I am all of those positive emotions. I'm just, I'm real excited. I'm oh. so excited to finally, it's actually finally be talking to you face to face because we've talked so much and, you know, to finally have this face to face, I'm so ready. Oh, me too, as well. Uh, someone who I have interacted with in digital realms only in the most positive of fashions, and now to be able to sit down and talk our favorite hobby. Speaking of our favorite hobby, uh, let's kick it off. Let's begin at the beginning. Uh, what is your story regarding tabletop? How did you get started? What first brought you to realms of myth and legend? Right. So the my first, what brought me to tabletop actually was a video game. Um, when, uh, like around 2000, I think was when I've never played any of the like PC Baldur's Gates, but mm -hmm. when that PS2 game Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance came out, I was like, this is an RPG. I like those things. Uh, so I played it. I didn't quite understand what I was doing. Like when I was leveling up my character, turns out, you know, that's how you play D and D is like leveling up the character and stuff like that. Um, cut to, there's a lot of smash cutting in my story, uh, smash cut to, uh, the end of high school, um, where I got together with a group of my friends. We had, we were building this like kind of world building outside of tabletop. And then when one of my friends was like, well, let's play some D and D let's build our, our little world and characters in D and D. So we did that, but didn't really get to play, mm -hmm. um, smash cut to a couple of years later, when I did play my first 3.5 game, uh, where I played a human uh, in a dungeon crawl who, you know, couldn't see and nearly got herself killed trying to engage with everything before the rest of the party, uh, come to find out that my inventory was full of torches and my best friend will never let me live that down. <laughs> Oh my God. Well, I want to dive into something you said too that sounds amazing, which is that you and your friends were already creating and world building together. Uh, was that totally like system free, just creative writing? Or was there a system yes. you were using? Oh, very. No, cool. no, it was absolutely system free, creative writing. Um, one of my friends at the time had such a, a brilliant imagination, like had built this entire world and this entire pantheon. And like, you know, as, you know, 16, 17 year old kids, of course, we all have our own little places in the world and as a part of the Pantheon. And if I could kind of describe what my character, her name was Zoe at the time, if I could kind of describe what she was, she was like a, a shadow sorcerer rogue multi-class. Like, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you've ever seen the anime Elf in Lead. It's a really like short anime, but it's very, a little traumatic, but it's, the storytelling was wonderful. Um, there's a character who could like manifest these like shadow arms from herself. And my character was also a character who kind of did that. Like, however, that would have worked in D&D at the time. I don't remember. But she could do that sort of thing. And the the figuring out how to put that in D&D is a very interesting thing always, you know? Well, that's, I think, one of the things that is so fun. I, much like yourself, I also, even though I've been playing D&D since I was a really little kid, spent plenty of time doing systemless world building, you know, and there's a lot of different forms that took, I know people, there was a lot of like my nerdy friends growing up who did like forum RPGs, like, mm -hmm. you know, post by post RPGs, people. Absolutely that, that kid. 
Exactly. So, what, well, you know, and I was doing, whether it's on a live journal and it's all long form or whether it was over like AOL Instant Messenger mm-hmm. and it's mm-hmm. like fast paced, sort of like almost like, you know, text based fantasy improv, basically. Yeah. Um, uh, it was so much fun. But like you're saying, that's that is such an interesting challenge, especially if you're trying to port over creative work that has been originated from outside of a system and trying mm-hmm. to put it on D and D's rails. Did exactly. you? What was your experience like of trying to like translate your direct creativity into a system? Um, so for her specifically, because she is the only. Uh, the only sort of creation that I have tried to do that with, um, I only because I haven't gotten to play her, I haven't really delved into exactly what, how her powers would manifest in a D and D sense. But um, I got as far to say as that I think she would be like a shadow sorcerer rogue. Like for example, like I thought of her very much as like a, a more badass talkie. From like Soul Calibur, mm-hmm. the the screaming ninja, as I like to call her, because all she does is she runs around and like she screams, and then all of a sudden you're dead. <laughs> uh, hell yeah, I love that. <laughs> uh, screaming all the time, not super helpful for stealth, but an amazing style, and yeah. <laughs> ultimately very entertaining and fun to watch in a video game. Um, what's sort of uh, I think there is a very interesting thing there because w- w- discovering the game, there is that weird moment where you first start hitting up against like, well, it's magic, so anything should be possible. But for some reason, you do want the mechanics. Like there's something about the rolling of the dice. There's something about the hit points. We would like you you find that. And obviously I was doing the freeform role playing and the system based role playing at mm-hmm. the same time. And there is just, uh, there's a different kind of, you know, for lack of a better word, it's a different high you're chasing in both. It's like sometimes, like for me, freeform role playing, oh, I've got to trust these people implicitly because there's no arbitration system other mm-hmm. than this. But even with that, I would still want to be playing D&D and other systems like that because there's something so intoxicating about not knowing if you're going to live or die, not mm-hmm. knowing if you're going to succeed or fail. Um, and then there's a, there's a, Again, like for for lack of a better word, there's a different high in acting completely freely in free from RPG and working within the boundaries of something like a system. Yes. Um, to kind of kind of backtrack on your uh, kind of backtrack a little bit when we're talking about um, building into systems and things like that. A lot of my characters are based on things that I do in real life. Mm-hmm. Um, so when it came to building Dahani, for example, um, I'm real big into like flow arts and object manipulation, like hula hooping and poi spinning and like rope dart and stuff like that. And while Dahani doesn't necessarily use those things, Mm -hmm. like those things are very like monkey or, you know, bard like, and, uh, a lot of, I get a lot of joy in figuring out how to translate those things. Like, um, you know, like rope darts and things don't exist in 5e. Like, yeah, I mean, like, I mean, I don't, I don't, I think they may exist in like 3.5 or, or, or 3e, but like, you know, if I were to give Dahani a rope dart, for example, I have a lot of fun figuring out like, what should the reach be? What kind of damage does it do? Is it like, does it have a, an actual dart on the end? Or is it like a meteor hammer? Is it a bludgeoning weapon? Is it a pin weapon? You know, does it come back when she throws it? I really get a lot of joy out of it. I couldn't agree more. And it's very funny because I think that, again, uh, uh, for some people, the different halves of tabletop games become more or less appealing. Like there are some people that really dive into the crunch and the mechanics. And there are other people that are like, I'm, I'm all about the story and the narrative. And for me, it's like, yes to both. Fully exactly. and completely. Yeah. I love them both. Give them both to me. That impulse, uh, and I know exactly the impulse you're talking about, where there is, um, it's one of the reasons that for me, character creation is like such a fun part of the game. Of mm-hmm. sitting there and being like, how am I going to do this weird, I did a one shot with B. Dave Walters where I played, hey, shout out to Dahani and Aarakocra writ large. Uh, <laughs> I made an Aarakocra monk, much like mm-hmm. Dahani, 
uh, named Peregrine, and much like everything B. Dave runs, all 20th level. Of course, of, <laughs> of course. course. And I was like, you know, there's way you can, there's very easy ways to make a broken 20 level character, but I want to, I want to give myself a challenge. And the character's entire fighting style was based around uh, grapple checks, movement speed, because there's this one thing within grapple that you can, if you grapple someone, you can move them up to half your movement. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, if I have a fly speed and I'm a monk and I have haste cast on me, I can grab you, and now we're in the we're sky. We're going, right, we're going up. <laughs> we're going up, you and I. Um, so, but, like, it's so interesting to think about, like, um, do you feel like that is a different creative impulse than the storytelling impulse? And if so, uh, like, how do, how do you, like, harness those together as the actual campaign goes forward? Because I totally would spend an afternoon figuring out how to make a rope dart work and would be <laughs> so happy. Um, yes, uh, there is trying to make those meet is something that I am not struggling with right now, but um, as you mentioned, I am in the DM's chair for Rivals this this season. Um, and with the story that I've already had in mind, it's like now there are a lot of people and a lot of things that I want them to encounter, which means that, yes, I have already done the world building and they're going to supply the role play and, you know, the storytelling but now I get to be crunchy with my NPCs. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, nothing bad. I mean, here's the thing. You're playing D&D &D with all-star D&D players. And the threat that always comes with that is if you just pick something out of the monster manual, the odds that they're going to know it back and front. So mm -hmm. I always love getting crunchy with it. A little bit of homebrew on a monster goes a long way. Yep. Uh, <laughs> Legendary uh, actions on a CR3? What are you talking about? <laughs> I, oh God, that's so funny. The idea of like just a cricket or like a regular sized spider, but it's legendary. So it's it's going multiple times per round, but yeah, mm -hmm. it's only CR3. Um, <laughs> God, that's so fun. Um, I wanted to, so, so actually, I, look, I want to come back to that as well, but okay. talking about Rivals for a second, I also want to talk about something really incredible about Rivals that, uh, so many Rivals cast members have experience in that is pretty unique amongst streams, which is trading off DM duties. Yeah. And, uh, and I want to talk, uh, I want to hear all about, I'm sure you have a ton of thoughts about it. I want to hear all about it because A, it's very, you know, if not unique, it's, it's incredibly rare mm -hmm. and it's, awesome like giving like as like perma dms like the idea of i think there's a lot of healthy stuff to learn from that idea of like hey this is a lot to ask like we, i want to see other people jump into it what are like the 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 go-to's what are like the, the the general best practices for a table that are trading off those duties um so first of all um it's completely voluntary like nobody has to run if they don't want to um, that is one of the things that we've kind of, I, I, I say, I say we, it's still weird for me to say we, even though I'm like a, a newer cast member. Um, but that's one of the things that we always try to impress. Like you don't have to run if you don't want to, we would love to see you run. We would love to see where you're going to take that story and how you're going to make it different from everybody else's, but it's completely voluntary. Mm -hmm. Um, secondly, communication between seasons, super, super important. Um, I think, and they can quote, they, they, they can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that my season is the one, one of the seasons where the previous season story hadn't been completely resolved before moving into the next season. Um, so small spoilers, we went to jail last season. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so trying to figure out how we were going to accomplish our mission and get out of jail we did that, but it wasn't completely resolved at the end of the season. So coming into that, uh, into the, the chair, I had to resolve that story that Tanya was trying to tell um, in the previous season and then move forward with my own story. So before, uh, during our season breaks, we will, we'll, we'll talk like, what did we want to accomplish last season? Did we do that? Do we want to continue on with that? Or are we ready to move on? And then there's, 
um, talking amongst the characters as well. Like I asked everybody, is there anything that you want to explore during this season? So that way everybody feels like they're a part of the story. Um, and those, those are really like, I mean, communication goes an awful long way at the table. Like as long as you're making sure that everybody is, you know, safe and happy and comfortable with the story and that communication is there, which I do believe we have, we have fantastic communication between us. Um, like you're going to have a great experience and like nothing, I'm not going to say nothing is off limits, but, um, just, I get just making sure that everybody is comfortable. <laughs> well, hell yeah. I mean, as you're saying, like communication is the heart and soul of a healthy table, no matter what. Um, when the, like, uh, uh, when that transitional period is happening, where, a, where, like you're saying, a torch is being passed off, um, is there a, uh, uh, and I don't want to, like, if, 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 if this is top secret confidential information, feel free not to tell me, but are, is, for the most part, is it like, hey, if I had a piece of story unresolved, like, I'm going to let you handle that in your own way. Or is there some, like, notes passing of, like, here, like, even up to the, the thing of, like, hey, this NPC that's been helping you the whole time, they're secretly, like, a bad guy. And then you go, like, holy shit! Like, I was just a <laughs> PC and didn't know that. Yeah. Um, so those secrets do get passed off like that. Um, yes, yes and no. Um, I didn't have a lot of NP, like, a lot of brand new NPCs to encounter, like, a lot of, a lot of, Tanya created NPCs, I'll say. But yes, um, as we were wrapping up the story, she did pass over character sheets so that I could, you know, use them if necessary. So yeah, there is there is some 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 uh, notes passing, I will say. Cool, because I mean that makes a ton of sense too. Because it's what you guys are pulling off is a pretty remarkable feat in terms of it. Because it's like it's not like you're just passing off to another DM and going like, okay, we're gonna play in a new world for a little while. Like the continuity of the narrative moves from hand to hand. It's almost like a, a those, what do they call like an exquisite corpse, like a beautiful mm -hmm. like, <laughs> with the exception that you're not just seeing the part right before you, but that idea of something totally collaborative where the DM and the person in charge of the environment and the NPCs and stuff is really fluidly moving from hand mm -hmm. to hand. Um, let me ask you a question, and this is very much like an obvious thing of of me as like a perma DM being like, what if I got to play more often? But like, <laughs> But like, um, how does your relationship to your player character change when they transition from becoming a PC to an NPC? Um, so that's, that's the question there is, do they really become an NPC? Right. <laughs> um, because uh, that was something that I was dealing with in the first episode. Like Dahani is is being quiet. So it is, it's a, it's a one, it's a conscious choice for me as Dahani's player to mm -hmm. make her quiet. Like not only like there, there are reasons for that, but it also keeps her involved in the story while making sure that she's not forgotten because I've tried like prior to this, I have tried to run a table of adventurers with a player with, with my own player character in. And it's like, Oh, they're, they're here too, <laughs> right? A hundred percent. So um, it is a a kind of conscious awareness of Dahani is here because I didn't make the choice to, you know, in in, in Tanya's case, like, things happened in the previous season that made sense for Celise to kind of go off and not be around for the last season, but nothing like that has happened for Dahani. So it's a conscious awareness. What do you, it's it's the same question that I have to ask my players. What do you want your character to experience this season? What do I want Dahani to go through this season? And once I've figured that out, what how, what level of involvement does she have? You know? A, a million percent. And there's a, and that level of involvement is, because it's there's very interesting things you know, there are certain things that I know I wouldn't struggle with under that set of circumstances. Like the little, the little kid munchkin in me is going like, okay, so I'm the DM now. Oh, my PC finds a holy adventure longsword. Like, how about that? 
<laughs> wow, you know, like that kind of thing where you're you're manipulating reality to, like obviously people that are invested in good storytelling are not going to do something like that. <laughs> However, it doesn't. The things that I think about in my head are, you know, being self aware of my own DMing style. I love my NPCs a lot, but I also can be extremely ruthless with them in terms of like, you know, it's like it's like being, you know, one of the writers on like Game of Thrones or something of like, mm -hmm. hey, man, when it's your time to go, it's your time to go. Like, you right. know, it doesn't matter how much the audience likes you. My PCs can think you're great. If it's your time, you're getting written off the show. And there's a certain degree of um, I'd feel horrified to do that to a character that was my own PC. On the other hand, I also think of the degree to which, like, when you're a dungeon master, you, the characters that you are responsible for, it's almost like, um, you know, like like the agents in The Matrix, where they, like, just mm -hmm. appear wherever they need to? Mm -hmm. There's almost a degree when you're DMing of, like, hey, if there's an NPC traveling with you and I know that we need a horror beat to happen, that NPC is the one who gets doppelgangered or possessed. Mm -hmm. Do you do you feel like an impulse towards Dahani of like I'm gonna be as respectful of Dahani as a normal DM would be of a PC? Or if some story beat that I want to hit comes around, Dahani is absolutely a fair target, like any of my NPCs would be. Um, this is a question that I have not considered, and now that I'm thinking about it. <gasps> I may lean the the, the latter. Like Ooh. if 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 there's a if there's a fun little story beat, like yeah, I'll throw her in there. That'll be fun. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I think that is I, personally. I think that's my instinct as well. Is like if if this person falls under the purview of me while I'm DMing, they are fair game for things that I would maybe telegraph or communicate a little bit more to a player character, mm -hmm. you know, like, like, like don't, don't let your, the rest of your player, player characters be um, bombarded or surprised by this decision. Like you drop those hints, you say, Hey, you know, something might happen to one of you. Yes. And then, Oh, there's Tahani. <laughs> Or, yeah, exactly. Precisely. And the thing of like, under no circumstance would I ever just narrate that a character becomes kidnapped. We would mm -hmm. resolve athletics checks. We would resolve combat. But if my former PC is now under my control as a DM, and I think it's a cool story thing for them to be like visibly kidnapped or captured by the enemy, it's like, oh, am I going to like, I'm not going to afford my PC the same degree of like, systemic fairness of like, I will let you roll to escape. I will let you roll perception. Mm -hmm. If it's like, hey, for this season, I'm sorry, you might be an N a, be a PC theoretically, but you're operating under NPC rules for this exactly. one. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, that's so fascinating to consider. I love, and again, it, that, that could only happen in this world where you're, you're passing the baton back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, um, what kind of heads up uh, do you guys give each other as a cast for passing that baton? And what does that prep work look like going into new seasons? Um, so about halfway through um, a, a current season, you know, a, a getting a future season dependent, of course. Um, but about, you know, if about halfway through, or I mean, if anybody is kind of like really gung ho for it, you know, I think... Yeah, it, it was about halfway through season eight that I said that I wanted to to uh, run this season. But, you know, we if nobody is um, if nobody is openly volunteering, we'll ask, you know, does anybody want to, you know, does anybody have a story they want to tell? Does anybody want to sit in the in the DM seat? Um, we, you know, Sharif ran for two seasons Mm -hmm. Because uh, you know he his story wasn't finished, yeah. and that was you know and and that that was you know that was okay with us that was okay with him, and sometimes I mean that might happen again you know I yeah. think as as long as every again as long as everybody is comfortable with that decision to you know stay in the seat for another season or to pass the torch you know we're we're fine with it. Hell yes. Um, well, speaking about like 
prep work and storytelling other stuff more broadly. I wanted to circle back to something you talked about, about first of all, how extremely rad in terms of like poi and rope dart and all that cool acrobatic <laughs> stuff. Um, uh, and you had mentioned like making your characters off of a sense of the hobbies and interests you already had. Uh, what is your feeling about like modeling D and D characters off of your hobbies? Like how often have you done, how many of your PCs have been like representations of just like an area of your interest at the time you were making the character? Most of them. Hell yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so Dahani, Dahani came from an interest in playing more monks and the fact that I've never played an Eric Coker before. So it was, it was kind of a, a, a meeting of the minds there. Um, I have a tiefling bard who, she's a college of swords bard, but instead of swords, she uses fans, katana style, right? Mm -hmm. Because I also spin fans. Um, any character that uses a glaive that I have is because I really like bow staff, but I don't want to be a monk, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, finding, finding ways to meet those hobbies, but at the same time kind of like flip them and reverse them a little bit. Cause you know, bow staff, you automatically think of a monk, but no, what if my bow staff had a blade? I'm a fighter now. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, it's so incredibly cool that I'm just thinking about like, um, uh, the one or two times I've gotten to do like staff work or stuff in stage combat. So hearing that you do fans and point all that stuff, so incredibly cool. Um, and I think it definitely does like enrich character. It definitely like, if you come to a character with an idea of an area of interest that you're building that character around, I think it does add so much like, texture and richness to the playing of that character mm -hmm. um and monk specifically is such a cool class to play within all of that acrobatic stuff and like uh uh like using these sort of like weapons that are still based on things that are almost like performance art like mm -hmm. fans poi like like uh, staff work things like that um it's very very cool um I want to talk a little bit too uh, about your work on Into the Motherlands. Uh, All right, work, uh, working as one of the writers uh, for this incredible stream uh, with a bunch of friends, Christina Ariel, obviously, and Pirates of Leviathan, B. Dave Walters, Tanya DePass, uh, a bunch of awesome, awesome people. Um, how did that start up, and what was the writing process like? How much were sort of the writing staff like? Uh, uh, sort of focusing on different areas or were you all like, you know, sort of working in a room together and pitching on the same stuff? It was definitely kind of a, a, a working uh, working in like different areas and stuff. You know, I, I, wa I am one of the adventure designers. Um, I was supposed to have, my adventure was supposed to have gone on stream, but because of reasons that you know, Mm -hmm. um, that fell around that same time. Um, I had mm -hmm. to, my adventure took a back seat and will hopefully be in the book. Um, mm -hmm. I, it's, 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 it's a very fun little thing that I've, that I've written. Um, but it is like, it, it was a, a collaborative, it's, it's a collaborative effort. Like, you know, one person will throw out, like, I mean, obviously B. Dave and Tanya have like the bulk of the, the skeletonization of like the, the, the um uh gosh there's a word the the word that I cannot find I don't want to say races cultures of the cultures mm -hmm. yes. um and um you know other people have taken like the settings and things like that and um I get to pull from those and then you know use all of that to kind of mold my adventure and at the same time if there are things that I don't know about that you know, I want to put in my adventure, I go to whoever wrote it and I'm like, oh, yo, Gabe, tell me about the desert. What What's in the desert? Or, um, you know, because mm -hmm. my, my adventure focuses in that desert region that we have created on Musalia. Mm -hmm. um, so cr both creating and using everybody else's creations to like form this world, like it's, I mean, I've never kind of worked in a, in a, cohort like it i will say um but everybody was super excited and super gung-ho and it, it was it's it's very rewarding to be a part of that team uh it is truly as we said before we went live like one of the most powerhouse teams of ttrpg creators and also just so cool to see again like a team brought together to bring that wealth of lore and work 
Um, for for we've done a lot of conversations on world building, which gets a lot of focus and attention, I think, from prospective DMs, people that want to pick up this for a first time. And I think what's interesting is that we do a lot less talking about adventure design, which is incredibly critical. And I think it's so cool to hear that you came onto the project specifically as an adventure designer, because it's a very different skill set. And mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, and it's something that I think can be really challenging for people to like articulate, especially if they're like, it's all being wrapped up as one thing. Like a DM is world building and adventure designing and helping you with character creation and getting the snacks and scheduling the next session. <laughs> and it, you know, it, as yeah. tends to be the case uh, for everyone listening, help your DMS out and take some of those stuff. Don't, let them be the one to get snacks. One of you exactly. can get snacks. You can um, go get the fruit snacks for once, please. <laughs> Uh, uh, which is not to say that the DM needs to is like a higher status. It's just like they are they're already bringing something to the potluck, which is the mm -hmm. adventure. So you know, let's all have it be uh, equal. You know, um, that being said, um, what's fascinating is like actually focusing on what adventure design means because I think that this is where a lot of folks get lost um, mm. because it's it's really not like writing a story you can't if you could you could be an amazing novelist and you could design such a bad adventure and <laughs> so like thinking about it as its own skill set what do you see as the main building blocks of building an adventure versus building a story. Okay, that is, again, you're asking me so many things that no one has ever asked me. Uh, <laughs> this is good. This is making me think about so many things. Um, so I will say that most of my writing experience is in sort of adventure design and building. I have a couple of adventures on D&D Beyond um, set in the uh, the Wildmount area. When, when Wildmount came out last year, they brought me on to do a couple of the mini adventures in the book. Mm -hmm. um, and it's far and away easier when you have a template. You know, it's like you go to a city and uh, as you enter the city, there are two people who are having an argument about something and they have decided that the only way to settle this argument is through an obstacle course race around the perimeter of the city. How do your characters get involved in this and what is the outcome? Like, you know, mm -hmm. Stuff like that. But when you're building from scratch, it, or at least when, when you're building from, yeah, no, let, let's just say when you're building from scratch, um, you have to come up with all of that stuff. So coming up with the conflict and figuring out not only like how to involve your characters into that conflict, how to get them invested in that conflict, but also the myriad of ways that this conflict can be resolved. And then, you know, after conflict resolution, like what happens that is at the end of the adventure, is this a one shot or is this something that is leading on to something even greater? Does the thing that resolves the conflict start a new conflict, you know? Yeah. And then not to mention bringing in, you know, the D&D &D mechanics or whatever system mechanics you've just, you know, for whatever system you've decided to build, but um, choosing the right skill checks, you know, um, making the right saves, putting the right monsters in, um, all of that can be very, very, very overwhelming, but so, so rewarding when you've managed to like kind of, kind of slot all of those pieces in together, especially yeah. when you come up with something that is uh, completely out of left field. One of my D&D Beyond adventures takes place in a, um, like an orc and like half work village where they're doing like a competition sort of thing. And one of the competitions I decided to put in there was direwolf jousting because who doesn't want to do that? <laughs> Hell yeah. Like who uh, doesn't like direwolf jousting? Yes. I want to do that right now. Uh, that is so incredible. And I think the reason that this is so different from world building is so much of world building and maybe mistakenly so, tends to be kind of static. You're thinking of like, I'm gonna tell, here's all of this, all of these 
you know, wildernesses and countries and natural wonders frozen in time. Here's the, here's the terrain and all that stuff. When you're designing an adventure, you actually kind of are designing. It's almost like planning a menu, like, like a four course meal for a, for a dinner in that time is an element of the creative choices you're making. You're making mm-hmm. what will ultimately be a series of moments. Mm-hmm. So I personally, I think what you're describing of like, Oh, dire wolf jousting. That's rad. <laughs> it's it's like that is the impulse of adventure design. Is like what's a moment that I know will be thrilling and exciting for my PCs. Mm-hmm. And if you're, you know, whether you're planning a, a meat planning a four course meal, you're making like an I don't know, flower arrangement, it's like, okay, I grab that one and I put that into the mix. Like I know mm-hmm. that's where I'm going to start. Um when you're making adventures, do you do you find yourself a lot being drawn to like the instigating events and like the first thing, or or is it like scattershot? Do you sometimes think of the ending first or the middle first? Uh, yeah, no, it's definitely scattershot. Nine, mm-hmm. like I'll say, seventy five percent of the time, it's in media res. Like yeah. I begin, I begin writing as the thing is happening, like as like most likely sort of the instigating event, or if there are multiple options to a thing like which option do I like most I'm going to start there um but so very rarely do I start at the beginning the beginning like if 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 I'm forced to start at the beginning I will never start (laughs) I oh I am so there with you and I think too one of my favorite things I ever heard about and like and why I I also like and media res as just a literary kind of like device someone said it once like and media res is the condition into which we are born in real life. Like mm-hmm. you get to a world where a lot of shit is going on. Mm-hmm. And by the time you can comprehend the world around you, it's like, hey, things are already going. <laughs> yeah. Like, jump in. <laughs> um, and there's, I think that there's, so that's why that type of storytelling device is so resonant. Um, and that idea again of like building these moments. And I think the central thing you're talking about too is conflict. Um, uh, which is central to the dramatic heroic narratives that like we want to see adventurers go on. When you're thinking of conflict as well, I feel like that's one of the hardest things too about writing adventures is like creating a conflict that is of the world, but which your PCs can find themselves attached to and embroiled mm-hmm. in. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on like, threading that needle of like having something that feels like the real world where it's like, yeah, the people like before you got to this city or whatever stuff was already going on, but we're, we're going to leave some kind of space open for you to jump into the mix and suddenly you're embroiled in it. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, how do you, how do you think about like threading that needle? Um, I don't really, (laughs) No, like uh, I a con like creating a conflict. What one? So for, first thing, I don't like you. I don't like stereotypical conflict. You yeah. know, I don't like you arrive at the city at just as a fight breaks out. What do you do? Like, I'm gonna leave. This isn't my fight, right? <laughs> <laughs> I you know it's like okay, and then you know you. You you go to leave and suddenly there's a chair thrown at your back. Now this is my fight. <laughs> I um, you know it really I I don't think that I think about it too much. At least not until after the thing is written. Yeah. I go back and I look at it and I'm like, no, that doesn't seem right. And then I'll put more thought into. Okay, so what? This doesn't seem right. What can I do? that makes it a little bit more organic, a little bit more natural, that if I were playing this, I would say, yes, this is something that I would want to be involved in. So yeah, I don't, I really don't think about it that much. (laughs) I love it. Well, that's the thing is, I think that there is a degree, what you can always count on PCs on is to start trouble. Like, Mm -hmm. honestly, I feel like the biggest risk in adventure design is how do I ensure that my PCs haven't already gotten themselves into trouble before scene one of this exactly. Um But there's an interesting thing there too. And I think this is something that like a lot of, a lot of people sort of think about because 
like you're saying, they're, they're, the more into the middle of a an adventure you get, the likelihood, in other words, this, you know, I could be totally wrong. I feel like when adventures derail, it tends to happen at the beginning or the end more than the middle. Like mm -hmm. once you're in the middle of it, it's like we already bought the plot hook. We already talked to the NPC and got the information. Now we're crawling through this dungeon or we're chasing this NPC across the expanses of whatever. And then you're doing that work that, like you're saying, can be largely almost mechanical. Like what are the right monsters for this? Mm -hmm. What's the thrilling encounter? What's the visual of like, what's a cool dungeon you haven't mm -hmm. seen before? Um, but like you're saying, it's, it's the ends and the beginnings. It's the idea of as this is concluding, what are we leaving open for later? And as it's beginning, what is that? Like we call it a plot hook, but it's mm -hmm. such, it, it's such an interesting thing because I feel like in a weird, my feeling is like in a weird way, the best conclusions are sometimes like plot hooks or they are like the next adventure is going to take off in a second. Right. Right. Uh, 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 but like, and the best plot hooks are things that I like, I, I have a hard time articulating it. Like the, cause the best plot hooks, you're almost trying to like incept your PC. That is exactly what I was about to say. Like <gasps> by the time, by the time they're, they realize that they've been hooked, they're already in it. You cannot go back. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, and like that's the trick is like how do you pull that off of like incepting that idea of like you want to do this. I feel like if I were, like I almost can't articulate what I would do as like the academic language around it, but I do know that like you're saying it's like you're trying to create a hook that invites your players to start shit mm -hmm. rather than starting shit yourself. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know how to phrase, like I can only give an example of, like you're saying, like having an NPC and come and smash a chair over a PC's head and be like, I'm your new bad guy, I hate <laughs> you, is a, like you're saying, it's like almost a little bit on the nose. Mm -hmm. So, but like a good plot hook is almost like, hey, they go to town. They're like, we're going to go to the tavern. There's a really nice bartender who makes them all a great drink. And then we see that bartender get smashed with the chair. Exactly. And, like, what is that? There is that thing of like, it's the, I don't know. It's the invitation for them to say, I get involved. Yes. Um, and it's not, I mean, you, you are right. Like I, I do not know how to describe, how to put words to what that is, but it is something that is like so enticing or not even so enticing. It just has to make them curious. Mm -hmm. Like if they become curious, then you've got them. Yes. It's about that instinct to keep like sniffing out the clues, sniffing out the information, because that's the thing about being a, a DM is the degree to which like, yes, you can take your players by the hand and drag them down mm -hmm. the story. Like a kid being forced to go to the mall with a parent doesn't want to be there. Like, come on, we're going to JCPenney. You know, like, <laughs> it's like that that idea of like, you can do that, but we all know how much easier the job is when the forward momentum is coming from intentional buy-in from your players. Mm -hmm. Um which can feel a little bit like trickery. There's like a little bit of manipulation in a good plot hook. Um, yeah. There's like by the, by the, by the time they realize that, you, that they're, you know, so engrossed in the story, I was like, wait a minute, we just came here to get like some arrows. How is it six levels later and we're about to kill a dragon or whatever, you know? <laughs> Exactly, uh, a million percent. Yeah, you want to you want to keep all that stuff hidden. You want to keep it. Uh, you want to keep it behind behind the the screen, so to speak. Um, well, we've been uh, flying flying past, and I would love. We got some great uh, audience questions here today, which I would love yeah. to uh, jump into. Hi, um, mommy. Woo! Uh, this first one comes to us from Adam O'Connell. Thanks, Adam O'Connell. Um, Hello, I teach a TTRPG class at a local after-school program where my students are learning how to play and eventually create their own game. What's the best way to get kids comfortable with playing? Uh, oh thanks. my gosh. Oh my gosh. This is beautiful. So um, 
uh, when I used to work for my local game store, uh, we have, well, I won't, I, won't, I won't say had, because we still do, even in the midst of... <laughs> um, but I ran youth D and D for a part of my tenure at the, at the local game store. So, um, first off, shout out to all of those wonderful, wonderful kids. That program is over a hundred kids strong right now. And I'm so happy about it. Um, how do you get them interested? Um, find out what they like, um, in terms of, you know, every kid, loves it. You know, I mean, just despite like despite the fact that they might not like to read or they might not like to play RPGs, like every kid like they're, they they love a good story. You know, even like, you if you like watch a kid play a video game, like just watch them for a little bit, you'll see the story that they are trying to create for themselves there. Um and you create a story that gives them that kind of experience or opportunity to play. Um, when I was running for the game store, you know, keeping the kids invested in D&D is as simple as giving them a pet, you know? <laughs> that is one of the best pieces of completely, like, no BS tactical advice. We could, we, you could honestly end the, the answer right there. Give them a pet. Next Give question. Give them a pet. <laughs> But also, also let them know that, you know, that pet, you know, so when my kids had pets, I told them they, they, they came from a magical pet store. Um, they knew that if they put their pet into combat, their pet was a target. And if their pet fell in combat, it didn't die. It just got teleported back to the magical pet store. You could go get it later, but it increases the, the likelihood that they will pl play a portion of a game without their pet? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Like, like honestly, honestly, pre-made characters that are that are simple, give them, give them fighters, give them wizards with one or two magic spells. Don't worry so much about like spell slots or whatever. Let them cast what they want, you know, um, and give them a pet. Give them a pet and a place to live. <laughs> I'm not joking. I'm not kidding. You give them a, uh, you, you say here, um, you know, as, in, as a reward for their first adventure, you have earned this keep. You can do what you want to this keep. And, you know, n in three or four sessions, you'll have a floating castle that stands above this keep. And you'll have, you know, a, a store inside the, the keep walls that is run by a sentient gelatinous cube. Oh my God. I I hope everyone listening and watching at home knows that you've just been given a pure diamond of advice. This is uh uh like you saying like give them a keep. In my head, I was like, any group of six children, that would be the rest of the day. Cause you would be paper and crayons and here's the, yes! here's, the here's the lightning turrets on the keep, exactly. here's where the dragon in the keep lives, here's exactly. where they get. Exactly. Um, like you encourage, encourage creativity outside of the game. You give them a keep, give them some paper and, and color pencils. What do they want in it? What does their room look like? And then they're, they're just as invested in the story as they are in that thing, because they want to keep playing the story to do more things with the keep. <laughs> uh, it is, that is so funny and real. Also just very good advice in life. Give people pets and keeps, give people a place to live and a cute animal to be with them. Um, and it's, I think it's probably not only good just for kids, but for adult players as well. Like the intoxicating feeling of having a place to defend. I often give that to players. If they get a home or a castle, or something like that, like I draw almost all the maps for my setting mm -hmm. stuff, just obviously, but uh, for something that's going to be theirs, that can be so fun to just be like, you guys design it. Um, we, I had a session with a bunch of people, people, including some dimension 20 players like Emily Axford and Brian Murphy, mm -hmm. uh, and Zach and Siobhan of, uh, the, of, they went to a city. It was filled with vampires. It was a very like vampiric Renaissance Italy kind of vibe place. Um, 
and they got this palazzo and it was very important because they were you know true vampires you have to invite in so it was one of the mm-hmm. few places they were safe but very quickly this running bit started about them just like loving the palazzo and they're like what's the property value on this could we renovate this place <laughs> Like we could actually make more, mo- we could make more money flipping this palazzo than we could killing these monsters and getting this treasure, um, and it became this whole funny thing of of like becoming realer. Like the bit started to gain traction and become real life, where it was like it was like, can we redo the outside of the palazzo with like holy symbols to repel vampires? And it's like, you're in a historic district. So you got to get a city council approval to redo the outside of your building. And they were like, all these goddamn NIMBY neighbors. Like we got, like we're running, we got to find someone to run for city council. Like, oh my gosh, that's beautiful. (laughs) That's so beautiful. In my Monday night game, our DM, uh, we traveled to a city where we were given uh, the run of a house for probably, you know, a month of in-game time. And honestly, the first two sessions after that were us just exploring the house. Like, uh, one of our characters found, like, a saber that you can pull from literally anywhere, but then it's like, as soon as you let go of it, it's gone. Like, it's just meant to be a defense mechanism. But of course, we are D&D players. So it's like, check every room for secret stuff. Like, there's got to be something awesome in every room. And like, you know, it may exasperate your DM a little bit, but you're having fun. <laughs> and that's all that matters. So much fun. God, it's just, it's just such good advice to just like, having a house as players is just such good, good advice. Um but to, to go back to the question as well, I everything you're saying, first of all, shout out to your LGS. Uh, support your local gaming store. Heck yeah. um, uh, you got to. Um, uh, and I think, too, again, with kids, this goes back to just like general child care education stuff, which is um, if, first of all, uh, uh, and, you know, huge gratitude and thank you to the Ask for the Question for running programming for kids because games like this can be awesome for kids to help inspire creativity and collaboration and all that good stuff. Um, I think one of the biggest mistakes people make with kids sometimes, like other adults, I mean, if and not to say that the question askers this way, but for everyone else listening, if you find yourself in a position where you're running games for kids, a lot of adults that necessarily like aren't necessarily like great with kids sometimes i think treat kids as this like puzzle to be solved Mm -hmm. you know like a friend of mine said the funniest thing one time like going to a party back when that was a thing that happened Mm -hmm. where they were like when i go to a party and there's a dog i relate to that dog as i need this dog to like me because (laughs) of how i will be seen by the other humans at the party exactly yeah (laughs) And that's not healthy to think of children that way, where it's like, I'm going to interact with a kid to show that I am the kind of adult that children like. And it's like, this kid will smell a phony on you a mile away. Um, Don't don't be weird around kids. No, they'll uh, know. They will know. and I think probably the best like advice as an educator I ever got was from someone who was actually teaching education, which was basically like children don't have an abstract love for academia or the sense that like what the skills you're teaching them are going to be useful later on. Kids, like everybody, believe that they have a firm grasp of what the skills they need are. Mm-hmm. Like they know what's important to them. Um, and in general, if you – if kids don't feel that you have an earnest investment in them as people, they are not going to invest in what you are saying or its importance. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think like uh, genuine enthusiasm for the well-being of the kids that you are with is a prerequisite to anything, yeah. especially when it comes to like teaching a set of crunchy skills and lessons like for the game like D and D. Exactly. Um, yeah. Um. But I do love, you know, all of that advice is like A plus about what gets kids engaged. Um, speaking of B. Dave Walters, I ran a bunch of games for B. Dave and some other great people, you know, Adam Bradford and Kelly Knox and their wonderful kids and B. Dave's two wonderful daughters uh, who were incredible. And I think, yeah, like the, the, the best thing like you're saying is like measuring attention and trying to keep an eye on like what is engaging and it becomes even more important to listen to what the kids are telling you is engaging to them. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, I mean, I, I had one kid who insisted that he wanted to bomb candle keep every, every, every session. Um, 
he got his own little mini montage of, you know, traveling on his flying griffin from town to town, trying to get people to join him in this cause to bomb Candle Keep. And that was what he liked. Did he get to bomb Candle Keep? No, because they would have killed him. But it was what he wanted. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, the kids will tell you what they're interested in. Doesn't mean you have to give it to them. Uh, but they will let you know, uh, where their head is at. Absolutely. Uh, I love that. Um, this next one comes to us from The Goodwin. Thank you, The Goodwin. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, are there any resources, e.g. books or blogs, you'd suggest for TTRPG enthusiasts to improve their adventure writing? Your adventure writing. Hmm. Yes. Um, the one thing that I can think of right now, um, it used to be the RPG Writers Workshop, now the Storytelling Collective, um, run by uh, Ashley Warren and a fantastic group of people. Ashley Warren was one of the writers of uh, Icewind Dale, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. Mm -hmm. um, she has developed this program to write your very first RPG adventure um, that I actually did go through, uh, mm -hmm. I think sometime, sometime last year. Um, I didn't write an adventure out of it, but like the tools that you, that, that she gives you and that you can use to kind of um, build those adventures are fantastic. So I highly recommend the Storytelling Collective. I think it's uh, at Storytelling Call, C-O-L on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Um, and she has a whole lot of, uh, it's, it's kind of expanded to this, this multi-resource thing now, uh, um, just not just the, the writer's workshop, but like, um, like dungeon crafting and a whole lot of other things that you can use to improve your, your writing. So I would definitely recommend that. Uh, hell yeah. More just straight up tangible, great advice. Um, <laughs> I just love that. You know, there's a lot, the theory is great, but it's also nice to be like, go here, you'll get better. Right. Um, <laughs> Um, I love that. Uh, uh, I would say too that like um, reading other people's adventures is obviously a great start. Um, uh, other actual play shows, watch Rivals of Waterdeep, you know, watch uh, uh, Dimension 20, uh, Critical Role, Adventure Zone, you know, all the, the, there's a ton of shows out there um, sort of see how things are done. But I do think as well that sometimes like do both, like look at the written material mm -hmm. and then look at how it gets translated into yeah. actual play. Right. Yeah, Cause there's, there's no, you know, there's, you know, I, I've given, I, I mentioned like one thing you can use, but like what you'll see as you watch these live plays and as you read these adventures, there's no one way to write an adventure. Like you're going to end up putting your own spin on it in terms of you know your your conflicts and your uh, your combats and things like that, so um, ex absorb as much media as you can. Even like you know find like watch Avatar for you know for for and you know find where the adventure is there. Like you know how would the library under the desert translate into a D and D adventure or you know. Even video games, how would a Tomb Raider level translate into like a written adventure? Like you can find inspiration in just about every piece of media. I love that. That's honestly a pretty awesome like thought experiment of like take an arc from an awesome adventure, like narrative series. And think if you think about it, like reverse engineering that as an adventure, all you have to do is take the actions of the main characters and say, cool, those would be player character actions, which means that I wouldn't be able to rely on or predict them, which mm -hmm. is the big, but for me, that's like the cardinal sin of a dungeon master is being like, and definitely the players are going to do this. And when they do that, this is going to happen. It's like, you don't know that the, you don't know. The right. The you know, like it's it's like going back to Avatar. If Sokka hadn't, it, you know, you don't predict Sokka drinking the cactus juice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Precisely, right? But you design an adventure in which maybe you know what the cactus juice, you know, does. But mm -hmm. it's that it's that idea of like having an element there of your create like looking at that and saying what would i need to prepare to have pcs move through that doing what they want to do but still always finding something interesting to interact with mm -hmm. um 
Uh, I love that. Um, and I think too that like, uh, also, you know, going back over old adventure notes is great too. Uh, the first adventure I ever ran when I was 10 years old, uh, it's one of the worst adventures that there's ever been. It was <laughs> hor horrible, 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 horrible. Um, uh, the, there was only, there was an invincible villain that there was only one way to defeat and, uh, it's really bad. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> even even to this day, I swear I have so much respect for adventure designers. We have people that that will be on our Discord and be like, Brennan, you gotta drop the session notes. And I always am like, I would be fired. You would if you saw <laughs> the, the scrambled Pepe Silvia chicken scratch nonsense that composes my session notes. I you, no one would ever watch a thing I did ever again. Um, <laughs> um this next one, uh, uh, this next one comes to us from Jamila Green. Thanks, Jamila. Thanks, Jamila. Uh, You're awesome. Woo! Uh, what are the most important skills do you think a person needs to learn in order to run slash play in a TTRPG for consumption, i.e., making a podcast or live stream? That's a great question. Yeah. What are the skills? Like we know the skills to just play with your friends. What are the skills a person needs to learn in order to run slash play TTRPG for consumption? That's a great uh, that is a very great question. Um, you need to, depending on the type of consumption, like, you know, live stream versus podcast versus, uh, you know, like an actual live event when those things happen again, um, you need to be able to work through distractions. Yeah. Uh, certainly, um, you know, live streams, like if you have your, your chat up and stuff like that, or, you know, be able to like minimize your distractions. Um, for consumption these days, it is a it is an interesting skill set to be able to narrate role play through Zoom, and I have no idea how you learn this skill set. It's just really just by playing. But getting those narrative beats is so much harder when internet is unreliable. When you know somebody you know may have lagged for two seconds. Um, so I don't, I, I guess extreme patience. <laughs> yeah. If you're going to, if like, if you're consuming, especially like live stream stuff. Yeah. Hell yeah. A, a million percent. Um, uh, you know, wrestling with, yeah, the media. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. No, I was, I, I have a question for you now, like the, it, it related to this, how has the, um, the relationship between you and your dimension 20 players changed? Like, you know, you all have this, this, enormous energy that you have around the table how has that translated to over zoom it's been wild well here's the funny thing is we we can only know what we know and by that i mean we have a vibe in the room with each other uh we assume that that translates because of the audience response mm -hmm. but fundamentally it's hard because like when in terms of camera awareness the only times I'm ever aware of the cameras when we're like in the dome are when I'm like spiking the camera for comedic effect. When I'm like, can you believe Zach or whatever, you know, like it's that moment of like getting that look. But for the most part, like I go into flow state and it's just me and my friends. Mm -hmm. I was so nervous, both for Pirates of Leviathan and for uh, uh, Unsleeping City season two, uh, and also for the last episode, the finale of sophomore year, which was the first Zoom thing we did because the pandemic hit like the week before we were about to be done with the season. Mm -hmm. And it was it was mortifying. There was a, there was because I was like, oh no, we're our like buddies at the table, the chemistry. And then we started playing. Pirates was so much fun, even with people that I'd never played IRL with before. And then we got back with our buddies. And weirdly, I think the love was so present because we hadn't gotten to see each other in months mm -hmm. that we were just like, oh, man, I'm so happy to see everybody again. But I won't lie to you. It's extra work to keep the charm on. Yeah. It is at, because I'm looking at a screen that also has like my email on it. You know, like I'm looking at a screen that also is a gateway to the world wide web and all of human knowledge, you know, like mm -hmm. there's, there, there are temptations that exist. And also 
I am more attentive when I can feel the electricity off of my friends' bodies than I am sitting in the same chair that I like sit in and have my coffee and zone out in the morning as I like read the news. Like exactly, yeah. It's it, like so. I think that I think we are able to recreate the magic, but I'm not going to sit here and say it doesn't take a little bit of extra diligence. Like you've got to know not to be like zoning out. You got to stay mm-hmm. engaged, right? Mm-hmm. Um. Um, but you brought up camera manipulation, which is another good thing that uh, that is an, another good answer to this uh, to this person's question. Um, knowing where you are, like if you're again, if you're making media for like um, visual consumption, that's what I'm looking for. Um, knowing where you are in your camera and what you are doing, like if it's not your turn, if it's not your moment to. I'll say be present for lack of better words. Like you can't like, especially if everybody sees you, like you can't be in your phone or, um, you know, just kind of like, you know, like clicking on YouTube, like, Oh, I'm going to watch this video later once this show is over or whatever. So knowing, um, keeping that energy and like, you you don't have to be completely on all the time, but be aware that you are visible, you know? Yes. Exactly. I think that's, yeah, having that, yeah, the awareness of your visibility, the awareness that if you go glassy eyed, that that's being recorded uh, is very <laughs> critical. Uh, another thing I'll throw in there, actually, there's a, I feel like there's a bunch of great stuff to throw in this question. I'll throw another new thing in there. There, You have a responsibility if you're doing consumed D&D play. And I am hard i have some friends that are like hey we're just kind of using DD to do an improvised storytelling podcast i am very much like a purist about actual play you should be playing the game the dice should matter it should feel like a game um i'm very into that that being said you have a responsibility if you're making consumed media and especially if you're doing it live to take big swings oh, you gotta yeah. you gotta make big choices you know, when I look back at Dimension 20 and I think about like the the things that are like, would that be advisable in a home? Because the point of a home game is your audience is yourselves. The cast mm-hmm. is the audience. And if you have fun all sitting around and treating it like a game of Pandemic or Arkham Asylum or whatever, where it's mm-hmm. like, we really need to make the optimal choice. I'm okay taking 20 minutes to like stop down and figure out the right thing. If you're doing it for an audience, the, the best rounds or the best decisions in Dimension 20 history have been uh, things that might be really ill-advised or just yeah. like not optimal. Like yeah. uh, uh, our amazing social chief, Andrew Bridgman, has been doing work on uh, our Dimension 20 TikTok. And we just had a TikTok of the incredible Mike Trap turn from Escape to the Blood Keep, where he takes his turn... Um, to make a nature check in in a pitched combat, to make a nature check because he remembered a piece of foreshadowing about a monster, and it let me take a huge monster mini and slap it on the table. Spoilers for oh heck movie. yeah, <laughs> you know it does this. It's like oh my god, and it's like in a home game, would it be optimal to waste your turn in a very deadly combat making a nature check? No. In this case, it's an awesome big swing of like, I'm gonna try to summon this monster I heard about two episodes ago. And that's the kind of like big narrative swing um, mm-hmm. uh, that is so, 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 so satisfying. You gotta take big swings. Yeah. Um, Getting those big like narrative and big character moments in there. Yeah, and and I think, and I would say there's also an onus if you're a dungeon master to honor those because I think if you're making consumed media, another example, spoilers for the Unsleeping City season one, but we had a character who cast detect thoughts on this frozen statue of the Angel of Bethesda Fountain, um, and it's like I didn't have anything prepared for that. That's that's not like the solution to the puzzle, mm-hmm. but it's like if I can improvise like a beautiful, like, oh, you see the heart and soul of this statue and detect thoughts, yada, yada, yada. Uh, I think as a DM, there is a little bit of responsibility on you of like, if someone does some weird creative thing that is really outside the box and you're making D&D media, you should find a way to honor that. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I love that. Um, 
yeah. Uh, so those are those are a bunch of great great skills. Um, uh, so then, oh, here's here's a, a fascinating one. This one's from Maddie C. Black. Thanks, Maddie C. Black. Um, uh, how do you deal with players that explore their trauma through their characters? I don't know how to deal with it properly as a DM. I don't want to invalidate, accidentally trigger, or anything like that. Very sensitive question. Thank you for the question, Maddie yeah, C. Black. Yeah, it's a very sensitive question. Um. For, uh, this is something that I've never had anybody at my table do. So I don't have a lot of like practical, like pr mm. practical advice, but um, I, I'm, especially because I have, I have played or I, I have uh, DM'd tables that involve a lot of kids, making sure everybody is comfortable with that content is, is very important. And um, in a way that you definitely let, like, like Brennan says, you don't want to invalidate that desire. But on the other hand, if it's something that can be potentially triggering to more than just that player at the table, everybody's got to know about it. Like, you don't, it doesn't have to be, oh, hey, Sally wants to, you know, uh, you know, kind of work through that time she almost drowned, you know, just to, to, to put something out there, you know? Yeah. Um, and you, you don't know, like maybe, maybe, uh, Jerry's got, you know, thalassophobia, maybe he hates the deep sea, you know, and he doesn't want to do that. Um, but you know, in a, in a sense, like if this player, if this player comes to you and says, Hey, I want to explore this, 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 and this, you figure out how you're going to do that in your story, you know, work out how that's going to go in your story. And then once I think once that is satisfying to that player, you approach the, the rest of the table. Hey, um, in this session, we're going to explore themes of blah, 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 blah. How does that feel to, to you all? You know, you know, safety tools, safety tools, get your, get your X and O cards out folks. Um, and check in multiple times with everybody to make sure that this is something that they're okay with, you know, make sure it's something that everybody is okay with talking about beforehand. It may become a little too much in the middle. X card. Are y'all feeling okay? Do you need to step back? Do we need to fade to black? What's going on here? Um, so I, I think if there, if I had a player who wanted to do that at my table, I think that's how I would approach it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, you know, and, and don't, don't out that trauma to the rest of your table. <laughs> right. Uh, yes. Um, I fully agree. Lines and veils, huge, great thing to be able to establish to, to have buy-in and having it be a living document of lines yes. and veils that people can update it and they go, Hey, I thought I was comfortable with this on second thought, maybe less. So um, I think that's really, really critical. Um, and I would say too, Within the context of the question as well, I think one of the reasons I bring up lines of mail specifically is um, a player wanting to explore trauma is something that I think in ways big and small, we, we all kind of do. I don't think it's necessarily always acute, but I think mm -hmm. any, you know, every little kid has made a character whose parents got killed. Like that's the most classic, like my parents are killed. I was, I was raised by wolves. Mm -hmm. That's a horrifying thought. Good gravy. That's really like traumatic, you know, most little kids don't tend to play it that way. They're just like, I'm a edge Lord, you know, ranger. Right. I was raised by wolves. My parents are dead, dead parents. My God. Like, you know, so to varying degrees of like tonal weight, mm -hmm. there is like in any time that you're dealing with a game that has as much combat as D and D and the ability for like characters and NPCs to die, there's going to be like grief and heartbreak and sorrow. And in some ways trauma, but it's the degree to which your game dwells on that. And I think mm -hmm. that like tone sadly is a big part of it. There are things that can be horrifying, but are like dealt with deftly enough. And that's why with lines and veils, you have veils, you have like, I'm okay with this theoretically existing in the world. I just don't want to mm -hmm. see it in front of camera. Right. Exactly. Um, and I think here too, when what I would say is there is a little bit of a veto, like the idea of the veto is an important one where someone yeah. can have a desire to explore trauma and you can go like, hey, there is nothing wrong with that desire. We have a player at the table who has set a line about subject matter related to this. Yes. 
it's a v it's a veto system and it's not invalidating your desire to explore that it's just that this table in this game is not going to be the place for that right yes Um, and there's there's nothing wrong with that either like every table is not going to suit every person every dm is not the right dm for every player you know you can kind of slot in all sorts of combinations like that and for someone who wants to explore something like that and and if you are vetoed that's also something that you need to respect yeah. because that person has you know just as as if you would you know if if you would hardline you know getting too deep into like a discovery of that like the these people may not want to get into that at all and that's not on you it's yeah. just not the right fit for you right now a hundred percent like you know boundaries need to be respected and but again like that being said there's nothing wrong with wanting to explore uh uh, themes that have to that might relate like you know i think that everybody has at one point or another explored something i i'm certainly someone who has through D D characters maybe not explored a like I think that we all deal with shit with our D and D characters. It may not be trauma, but <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, it, we we're all, like a lot of characters are about exploring different things or different things, things we're working on in our head, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and I think that um, if you feel that there is a huge, and I would say too that if you're, this is from the DM's perspective, from the player's perspective, I would say if you're going to be exploring. If you're like, hey, there's a part of my life that I actually would like to explore through allegory in my player character, I think that's really beautiful. And I'm not going to I've gotten so much growth and catharsis out of D&D characters and LARP characters. I'm not going to turn around and tell you not to do that. Mm-hmm. Lord knows I've done it. Um, uh, and it is cathartic and it has really helped me. That being said, you know, D&D is not therapy and your friends at the table are not trained professionals. Yeah, yeah, you should yeah. You, you should make sure not to substitute them for that and not to put that on them. There absolutely. should be an understanding that this, this is still a game. And yeah, you can absolutely get real catharsis and growth out of it, but it is not therapy, right? Right. Um, um, and I would say too, to yeah, to have that understanding and respect of you, if like, hopefully you really trust and love the people at a table that you want to go through something like this with mm-hmm. and that, because I think that should be there if you're kind of, you know, going processing something that that's, uh, that's traumatic. Um, but also that you are communicating to them like, Hey, I don't want to, you know, put all of this on you. Are we all groovy about this going back to communication? Like we've talked about before, um, from the DM side of that, um, I would say communicate insecurity, like, like communicate that. Like you're saying, I don't know how to deal with it properly as a DM. I don't want to invalidate it or accidentally trigger or anything like that. I think it is completely acceptable to go to your friend and be like, I support you 100%. Mm-hmm. I'm worried I won't do a good job running a storyline if this is dealing with some shit you're working through in real life. Yeah. Like, um, you, you know, like you that are- shows it, it, it shows how much you value that friend. Yes. You know, like. You, as 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 you said, you know, DMs and players are not therapists, but at the same time, there is a a great like if in 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 the right circumstances, in every circumstance, we should be honoring our players and our DMs all the time. But when you know yourself enough that you know you won't be able to give justice or you know to 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 something like that, yeah. I think that's just as good as. That's that's just as good as saying yes. Like saying no is is just as good or even better because you know that you are not the best person to take them on this journey. And saying yes when you know you're not that person can make it worse. A hundred percent. We have to respect no's from people. No, no counts. No matters. Um, no is a complete sentence. <laughs> I love that. Uh, uh, a million percent. Um, uh, uh, this next one comes to us from Co. Thanks, Co. Thanks, Co. Uh, thanks, Co. Uh, hey, Brandon and Co. I love this show. As someone who struggles with visualizing terrain, your sets have been incredibly helpful. But I don't exactly have a design team. I didn't have a design team for <laughs> a long, long time. 
it is the most unearned good fortune. It's uh, <laughs> shout out to Rick Perry and the whole squad. Oh my goodness. Um, do you have any tips for making simple but effective maps or reusing existing maps for both DMs and players? This is a great question. And I assume we're talking about battle maps specifically. We're talking about like grids. Uh, yeah, what's what's the go-to? Let's see, are you are you theater of the mind? Are you battle map? Are you roll 20? Where do you where do you live? Depends on the situation and how much effort I feel like putting into something. Um, <laughs> I'm going to yes. be real. <laughs> hey, effort is real. I also have the same amount of hours in my day as everybody else. Exactly. If I have a lot of prep time beforehand um, and there isn't uh, and there isn't a like, you know, already existing map, I will, I will draw. I actually, um, I got a lot of enjoyment out of drawing maps for, for some of my games. So it really, it depends on the people. Like if I'm doing an in-person thing and I have time and space to prepare something like that, yeah, I'll give them a, I'll give them a battle map. Um, online, primarily theater of the mind. Um, shout out to Roll20, but I, I need a tutorial. Real, real bad. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I like I like playing on Roll Twenty. I do not know how to work Roll Twenty. <laughs> I want to give a quick shout out here to Carlos Luna, our incredible Roll Twenty. Oh, yes, Carlos, Carlos, I love you. I love you so much. I miss you. Oh. Uh, but yeah, I don't I don't know how to work Roll Twenty. <laughs> uh, Carlos was our Dimension Twenty Roll Twenty maestro, literally like conducting and creating extemporaneously while we were oh. running Roll20 battle sets. Wow. Because here's the th here's the thing. Roll tw it's it's Roll20 has incredible tools that I do sort of like the, the simplest ones I understand how to use and then it has a thousand more tools. And mm -hmm. Carlos is the absolute Roll20 wizard who was able to come in because I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and so he was able to to be our our seamless conductor. Yeah, he's he's wonderful. Um, that, that guy, just like brief Carlos Love Fest for a moment. <laughs> Do it. One of the most multi-talented. Every time I talk to that guy, I find another suite of skills that he has completely mastered. <laughs> Uh, and it's baffling, uh, especially if you, like myself, are a one-trick pony. And uh, he's like so incredible. He's like he found is, out and and no, and and then he will give you that information for free. <laughs> <laughs> like no, have you like if you if you followed him on Twitter long enough? Like at one point he was like, here is you know what you need for like a basic streaming setup. You don't need all the fancy stuff. All you need is this, 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 and this. And then he did like a stream one day where he was like, here's what I use and here's how you can use it. And I mean, he helped us out. Um, we, my, my, my company and a bunch of other gaming system companies just completed a, a new game master month where we, you know, if you want to play a new system, we kind of run you through how to set up and, you know, how to run and like, what's the adventure? Like, what are the pieces of an adventure? Blah, 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 blah. But we did a panel last, last weekend that he was the role 20 maestro for it. I'm just like, can you not, or, or, I mean, continue, but also be amazing. I don't, he's, he's a wizard. He's a he, real wizard. He really, really is. Uh, uh, yeah. When I found out about the emo band, I fully lost it. I, I fully lost it. I couldn't believe it. Um, <laughs> well, wherever you are, Carlos, we love you. Shout out we to do. Carlos. We love you so much. Boom. Um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, for battle map stuff, look, the the like working with something on the on the level of like a Dimension Twenty set is such an unearned privilege. Rick Perry and his entire team, uh, it's staggering. For my home games, I use a a fabric dry erase surface battle map and uh, washable like like uh, uh, washable markers um, uh, because the the reason I like battle mats in general, like if they could be beautiful, amazing. What battle mats are really helpful with is the degree to which things like range and area of effect and movement um, can can make 
theater of the mind slow down due to negotiation and guesswork. So mm-hmm. there's, there's a degree to which if you can take two minutes to set up a battle mat, like as the table goes along, then um, things can be um, immediately like, we don't need to discuss your movement. You, the player, are figuring it out on the player before you's turn. You're mm-hmm. like, cool, that's easily within 30 feet of me. I know what I'm doing on my initiative order. Yeah. Um, so to me, I think battle mats, the, the job of a battle mat is um, distance, terrain, area of effect. That's really what it's trying to do. So I, mm-hmm. I, I don't need it to be pretty in order for me to get the utility out of it. That I'm right, for. right. Um, um uh so simple but effective is uh i would say the best guideline for simple but effective is yeah get some markers get a get a dry erase get get a you know reusable battle mat thing mm-hmm. um if you don't have miniatures uh, uh dice. dice are great boom exactly no dice dice are perfect for for minions as well um get yourself a bunch of d6s in a bunch of different colors um set them up like the the pips will be you know you know one two three four five six red one two three four five six blue and then there you go you're like i want to hit blue one or i want to hit you know red three and it's oh that's so helpful i'm gonna start doing that right now (laughs) (laughs) you it's yours it's yours <laughs> that is so helpful um uh truly that's an amazing thing um uh you know what i have an old thing because i inherited an othello set from my dad yes um, which if what the nice thing about othello is if you have if you go the markers route you can flip them over and write the amount of damage mm-hmm. on the little white side of the othello piece uh, uh if you're gross like me you will lick your thumb and smudge them as the damage <laughs> increases and then you get a bunch of spit covered othello tokens in front of your friends but that's another way uh to get the yeah. job done uh, and but- then like poker chips for for larger creatures that you can still stick a di- a, a d6 in the middle of so that you know you know this is large creature red seven se- seven seven sided d6 ladies and gentlemen <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, yeah, and I think, like you're saying, like that improv. Again, what it's about at that point is it's yeah, you're you're not. It's not a fully designed immersive set, but it, it like the goal of a battle mat, if it can't be pretty, can be to speed up and intensify your combats. Yes. So that we all are doing our turns faster. You get to spend more time like narrating and describing things cinematically. Mm-hmm. So. It, even if it's not high production value, it still ups the value of the combat yep. by letting you spend less time worrying and more Visual, time. Like, like trying to visualize it. Okay, like, you know, how far am I from the first goblin or how far am I from the second goblin? Is there anybody in area, is there anybody that I care about in the area of my fireball? Exactly. And I think, too, look, I love theater of the mind play, but if you're playing a character that has lots of different kinds of abilities, like you're playing a spellcaster, I recommend battle mat play just because, again, for me, it's like there is something so fun about being like, ooh, I can get right to that square, which lets me hit them with the bonus action thing. And I hit all four of these Mm -hmm. in the line of the lightning bolt. It's like. Uh, uh, which there's a certain kind of dopamine hit that comes from that really crunchy tactical play yes. uh, that some of your players might really enjoy. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, I think we got time for one more here. Um, final question. Final question. Uh, so much good tangible advice this episode. Um, Tyler Riley asks, thank you, Tyler Riley. Um, as a DM, how do I prevent my PCs from latching onto a small name drop or tidbit of lore, causing them to go on a tangent I wasn't expecting? Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Tyler, if you figure that out, uh, you Please. can reach me and Latia at... <laughs> This is the question that ends the vodcast. And I don't just mean this episode. I think Adventuring Academy is over. <laughs> this is the one you can't oh. answer. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm I'm so sorry, Tyler. You can't. 
They will. <laughs> Tyler, you may as well have asked us how to cease the setting of the sun or empty the water from the sea itself. This thing you have said cannot be done. They will go up to the weird NPC at the bar and adopt them, and it will be the new center of the session. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I, oh. I, I suppose we can theorize on wh- why that is. There's no avoiding it. I don't know. The PCs, they, they, I have an adorable, wonderful one year old nephew. His name is Huxley. He, he lives downstairs from me and Izzy, and he is a pure beam of sunshine. There is a bag of toys in our apartment that have been designed by professionals to be as alluring and enticing to a one-year-old as possible. Mm -hmm. That kid hates those toys more (laughs) than I can possibly describe. And if we have anything within reach, like a weird, dusty DVD remote, (laughs) a... um, A heavy glass coaster. Um... (laughs) Anything that kid is not supposed to touch is the thing that he will, by hook or by crook, get his little juice-stained paws on. Mm-hmm. And that, and I don't think that changes for adult D&D players. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the RPG equivalent of intrusive thoughts. Like, you see the stove. You know it's hot. I still want to put my hand on it. That guy's name, wait, wait, it's like, that guy's name is, is what? Jer, Jer, Dirksen? <laughs> Tell me everything I want to know about Jerkson immediately. <laughs> All you hear as a PC is Jerkson, and you look at your DM, and despite their poker face, he's that little bead of flop sweat, and you're like, you just made Jerkson up. You just made Jerkson up, and now Jerkson's my best friend. <laughs> Oh, it's the truth. It's it's the truth. Oh God, yeah, I know. I think you're totally right. It is. It's the intrusive thought. It's the don't think of an elephant. It, it you. It is. It is a a gravity vortex to which your players will be inexorably drawn. And Tyler, uh, I say not only to you but to me and Latia as well. Best of luck with that. I don't know if it's ever going to happen. <laughs> Oh my sweet goodness, that was, that's the best question I've ever had, ever. I'm so glad, I'm so glad we got to share this moment. If I, if I die after this is filmed, I will be satisfied in the thought that this question was asked to me. (laughs) Me and to you, Brennan. Yes. Oh, what a moment to share and what a moment uh, for us to conclude our episode. I couldn't have asked for a better one to go out on. Goodness me. Uh, uh, oh, Matias, yeah. thank you so much for being on the show. Today. Uh, again, thank you for having me. This was a blast. Oh, <laughs> absolute blast uh uh everyone make sure to go check out rivals of water deep uh with latia jacques uh go follow her on twitter and check out all of her work thank you so much for being here today latia and for all of you watching at home thank you and we'll see you next time